So, okay. uh, great pleasure uh, to introduce Sriam Ramaswamy from IC next door. Uh, and Sriam's going to talk about active particles in flow and caustic, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, Thanks, for, for those of you who know Monty Python and now for something completely different, but don't, please don't expect <laughs> the rest of that to follow. Okay, so I, I, yeah, I thought I'd talk about something that's not manifestly stat -y, but still has to do with aggregation, condensation, and phenomena of that sort. Uh, uh, it's work I haven't talked about much before and haven't written up, um, of course. Uh, done with uh, Raul Chajwa, who was a student here, supervised by Rama and uh, jointly by me. Uh, and it's about, it's about caustics, uh, a, a fairly lowbrow uh, version thereof. So, um, you know, first, congratulations, Deepak. One of the times I got together with Deepak doing something uh, a bit different was a refresher course in Surat, uh, where we ate lots of interesting food and lectured, I guess, to university teachers. There he is. And uh, congratulations, Deepak, on spectacular work and due recognition. Okay. Um, so I'm going to tell you, can I, you think the range is good from there? Yeah, great, yeah, yeah, much better. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about uh, a funny occurrence of the physics of uh, caustics. Now, caustics are these singular structures that you see in many places. You see them in, um, in David Hockney's paintings, but actually on real swimming pools as well. Uh, you see them as in this interesting work by Wilkinson and Malig in particulate suspensions. This is aerosols, I think, and you see them on much larger scales in the universe. Um, and in, in optics, I mean, you know that an ideal focus is unstable, and if you disrupt it ever so slightly, it becomes something like this. And uh, let's say in three dimensions, what you have is a surface forming the envelope of the refracted rays, and or on a 2D viewing screen, that will be a line. So there's an accumulation of rays tangent to the caustic and a divergence of the intensity uh, within uh, geometrical optics. Uh, that's a caustic. And uh, kind of a simple-minded way of seeing why you could get caustics happening in many particle motion is to look at, this is an example from this paper by Wilkinson and Malik. Um, if you just looked at a very simple two-dimensional phase space, that's position, that's momentum. And imagine you had a bunch of particles strewn on that phase space. Initially, okay, this is x, and this is, let's think of this as x equals zero, okay? So initially, you've got particles at negative x, that is over to the left, moving with positive velocity, that's forward, and hence p is positive here. Um, hence, the, the, the weight is at positive p's here. And at positive x with uh, negative velocities, then you know that as time goes on, this distribution, because all this stuff has a phase space velocity, as a position space velocity that way, will start moving like that. And at some point, you'll go to a configuration that looks like this. Uh, we're not plotting a function. We're just plotting the place where there is weight in phase space. Uh, so this uh, folding over is perfectly OK. But what happens then is right here, where the slope of the support uh, you know, in a p versus x plot is infinite here and here, roughly speaking, let's say, imagine this is x equals 0 then roughly speaking, you've got something like uh, a distribution in xp space, which is delta of x minus p squared, so that the position space distribution, that is, if you integrate over all the momenta, will then have a 1 over root x singularity uh, shown here. So the idea basically is if you've got fast movers back here, uh, initially they catch up. Uh, and so movers with different, with different speeds from different x arrive at the same time and the local density diverges. In this particular example, it diverges like uh, that. Um, and you know, this, this class of phenomena is uh, of interest because um, if you've got a collection of partic uh, particles and caustics form as a result of the dynamics, what that means is that uh, you have more encounters amongst uh, particles. And uh, interestingly, by the way, you know, as long as the particles don't, supposing you have an incompressible flow field, 
if you have particles strictly following the flow field, the particle velocities themselves can't have a convergence because the flow field is divergence free. But uh, you will see that you can get caustic formation even in compressible flow uh, for particles of inertia. And so this is a sort of novel uh, aggregation and possibly uh, non-equilibrium condensation mechanism. And if we are talking about active particles, uh, you could imagine them uh, you know, more effectively meeting up with each other, more effectively talking to each other, maybe more effectively making more of each other. Uh, okay, so that in some sense is why we care about caustics. Um, uh, a context in which friends of ours started studying uh, this problem is that is, is, is turbulent flow. 2D turbulent flow can be thought of as a whole sort of soup of uh, vortices. It's these Gaussian shaped uh, vortices known as Lamoisian vortices. Uh, one such vortex. Uh, has a, an azimuthal velocity field with this profile and a vorticity field with uh, a Gaussian profile. It's an exact solution of Navier Stokes. Uh, it's characterized by a strength, which is the uh, circulation, which is the integral of the velocity around a closed path. And that is done far away. And it looks like this. Nu is the viscosity over the mass density. And this characteristic size is. Uh, this quantity, square root of two new, uh, for new t. Uh, you can study inertial particles around a single, ah, so okay, now let me tell you about inertial particles. So supposing you've got particles in a fluid, uh, you can imagine particles that just meekly follow uh, the streamlines of the fluid, but you can imagine particles that, uh, uh, or you can imagine particles that simply, once you set them going, have such a high mass that they just keep going and ignore the fluid. But in general, what you will have is, uh, roughly speaking, you can imagine writing down an equation of motion for the particle. Let's say x is its coordinate and v is its, the particle's velocity. If it's placed in an ambient fluid flow u, u is a function of position. I'm just suppressing that, in, that label here. Then uh, the drag on the fluid and the inertia of the fluid compete in this, mat this manner. That is, if the particle had no inertia, it would instantaneously acquire the velocity of the fluid. But in general, it will have a dynamics of this form. Uh, tau is the Stokes time. It's, basically, it's the time that the particle's velocity takes to uh, relax to the local uh, fluid velocity. And if you strew a bunch of particles uh, in the presence of a single vortex, then what you find is a dynamics like this, in which you get a high accumulation of density at this inner edge. So this is an idea that is exploited uh, in these papers uh, in the context of uh, droplets condensing to make rain and so forth. Um, essentially, you write down the equations of motion, let's say you write in uh, circular polar coordinates, and you introduce an angular velocity uh, you let omega be the fluid angular velocity uh, at that given location. So you'll get equations of motion for the radial coordinate and uh, the, ra the, the radial velocity and the angular velocity that look like this, uh, governed by the form of the fluid vorticity. If you have a single point vortex, that index P is two. If you uh, non-dimensionalize by the natural uh, length scale given a circulation. Uh, then you work in terms of scaled coordinate and scaled angular momentum of this form. For the particular case of a single point vortex, you get equations of motion that look like this, okay? And uh, the centrifugal term that emerges in this treatment uh, mean, has, endows the particles with a bigger, bigger acceleration at small x. So particles from small x can catch up with particles at larger x. So if you try to naively construct the velocity field of the particulate component of this system, uh, unless you do some kind of diffusive or the smoothing, uh, uh, the velo particle velocity field in a strict sense becomes incompressible and that is uh, a caustic. And uh, so this is, I'm still not talking about active particles, I'm talking about uh, particles with real inertia, okay? Um, and uh, so you can ask uh, 
as a function of where you start the particles. Where the, where, so you have a bunch of particles as a function of where the particles start, you can ask how long it takes to form a, form a caustic. And it turns out there's a location beyond which a caustic doesn't form. So the time to form the caustic gets bigger and bigger and goes to infinity if the particles start too far out. Because in order to really take advantage of this effect, you want to be at small x, okay? Um, and you can imagine, basically you can imagine starting two rings of particles at close, but not the same radius and letting them go. And then depending uh, on the initial conditions you impose in that ring of particles, you can or cannot uh, get caustics, but there'll be an outer starting radius beyond which you won't get caustics at all, okay? And uh, so you can study, as I said, for a variety of initial conditions, you can imagine studying it with the particles initially having the background flow velocity uh, at the location where they're situated, and, uh, or you can imagine the particles starting out uh, with, so the zero inertia is a slightly confusing term. All I mean is the particles at t equals zero have the velocity of the fluid where they're located. But you can imagine starting the particles instead at zero initial velocity and then switching on the flow. So you get this interesting class of phenomena. Uh, if you upgrade this to a many particle study and in the presence of a large number of vortices by looking at uh, incompressible turbulent flow in two dimensions, um, then what you see is that depending on the value of the Stokes number, remember the Stokes number is a measure of, one way of saying it is how far the particle goes in units of its own size uh, on the time scale in which its uh, own velocity uh, decays or the ratio of its time scale to the time it takes the fluid to traverse the particle, then Low Stokes, so low, at low Stokes number, the particles basically completely uh, follow the flow. At high Stokes number, the particles uh, are somewhat affected, but at high enough Stokes number, they tend to ignore the flow. But at sort of Goldilocks uh, Stokes numbers, the effect is the strongest. Basically, in one limit, the particles simply go along with the flow lines and therefore don't uh, aggregate in any way. Uh, in the other limit, they ignore the flow completely. If they're moving very fast, they just ballistically move with whatever velocity they have. But in between is where this effect uh, is the strongest. And um, there's been a lot of work here in ICTS on this class of problems. And I sort of wandered into this problem from a different side, namely uh, not particles with inertia, but self-propelled particles, okay? Okay, so the idea basically, is, as I said, with increasing Stokes number, you have this sequence of behaviors with uh, strongest caustic formation at uh, intermediate um, Stokes number. And the question is, uh, does, yes? So, so you're putting equation of motion on both, on the x, equal to the positive v again, Maybe I had got a sign wrong somewhere. I don't know. No, the centrifugal really, barrier is a usual centrifugal yeah, barrier. Yeah, it's repulsive, but there should the also be a uh, final because they don't fly off, right? It formed a ring. Huh, the, the, the inner ones form a ring, but the ones outside, you know, it, it, things are being centrifuged out, right? You are going yeah. up, but also something to trap. There's no trap put in in this one. But why didn't they go off? Like, why did they form a ring, the particles? Sorry? In your picture, you they formed a ring, right? Okay, yeah, but, they, but they will eventually wander away. Yeah, yeah. But the point is, you know, uh, uh, if you want, uh, yes. In this one, there are other words. He was probably asking about the first movie with only with one word. Yeah. The sharpest density condensation or whatever, density enhancements. Right. You're out. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, now, what was I going to say about this? No, I wasn't going to say anything else about this. Okay, so the motivation then was that in some ways, supposing you got a particle with no, in, whose 
effective inertia is whose okay intrinsic inertia is negligible that is to say a particle whose mass is small enough that you can write down its equations of motion in aristotelian form velocity equals something times force but supposing that particle in addition to drag has a motor which propels it at a certain speed okay that's a different kind of persistence of motion but uh, you might ask whether it can i mean you know a bacterium has negligible inertia in its in the circumstances in which it lives but its its swimming speed it's persistent and it swims in fact for as much as a second in whatever direction which it's pointing before uh, losing direction so the question is if you take particles without you know sort of official inertia uh, but they're self propelled uh, can this kinds of can analogs of inertial forces emerge in their dynamics in the presence of imposed vertical flow fields so can things like centrifugation happen the idea basically is that these particles you know any particle with which is a reasonably persistent swimmer can be thought of as being endowed at least for a while with a little vector a little thing that can be reoriented you know let's say i'm a bacterium i've got a vector from tail to head and so if there is a flow the flow will act on that vector and possibly do things similar to uh, what happens uh, oh i can just look at that yeah yeah um, to what happens to particles of true inertia and uh, if this if such effects are there uh, it brings out an aspect of active particle dynamics which hasn't really received much attention namely the ways in which uh, flow fields vertical flow fields can affect uh, their behavior and so forth so uh, let me uh, this is my sort of obligatory couple of slides on active matter which uh, unlike in my usual talks is postponed to the middle of the talk so uh, obishek is probably smiling cuz he's seen the same slide before so what do we mean by active particles active particles are particles endowed with some machinery to convert a steady uh, you know particles with an assured supply of free energy and the machinery to convert it to movement which means that at each particle's level detail balance is broken and of course it's just our way of uh, referring to living stuff uh, but you can also make artificial versions of it and collections of things like that are called active matter uh, but today i won't really talk about active you know chunks of active matter i'll really be talking about strewing a few active particles in a fluid and seeing what happens and you can have different kinds of active particles i mean you can imagine often self propelled particles are elongated some of them have not only a polarity as regards their motion but also as regards their structure they could actually have a mechanical difference between two ends you could have things that are propelled with a propulsion vector but structurally uh, apolar uniaxial but apolar and you can have things that are apolar both structurally and uh, dynamically so these are some of the common examples studied you can also have uh, particles which are active in the sense they're busily running around by consuming energy but at least on the face of it they don't have a well defined you know structural or even very permanent dynamical polarity but uh, so they're kind of like scalar active matter you could call so you can have many different kinds and you could imagine asking questions about the behavior of these many different kinds of particles in uh, imposed uh, flow fields okay so how do we write down equations of motion for these guys so this is it is newton's laws as far as the particle goes but it's newton's laws with no mass so if x is the position of the particle what we have done here is to say that the velocity is a mobility times the imposed force more precisely the difference between the particle's velocity and the velocity of the ambient fluid is a mobility times the applied force that's the properly galilean invariant way of saying it in addition the particle has some kind of self propulsion i indicated it here by saying it's a parameter beta times a vector w for uh, the purposes of this problem uh, that vector w could be this that imagine the particle is structurally a dimer and supposing it's a dimer which uh, in the completely relaxed state actually has zero length you know these two heads are actually collapsed onto each other so that vector can be if you don't have noise and you don't have external fields that vector relaxes to zero okay so here i've shown it with some non zero that this w is that n to n vector of the dimer in order for it to be usefully a vector i want to have some distinction between the two ends whatever the distinction is is the distinction 
which the machinery uses to propel it in a direction determined by W. Okay. So that's the equation of motion. And I'll say that this entire right hand side is the particle velocity. Okay. I can also put in a noise here in this equation, but I won't because it makes life very difficult. Okay. Um, now, this n to n vector w being an orientation, uh, okay, if not, supposing nothing else was happening, supposing you had no flow fields, I'll tell you what these bits are in a moment. I seem to have, yeah. Um, if you had no external flow field u, then this n to n vector, let's say, likes to relax to zero. And think of it as just a, a completely overdamped mass and spring system. So w is just the extension of this dimer. And um, that relaxation time is actually uh, the ratio of some friction constant to some spring constant. And uh, you have a noise here. It's been written in such a way that if I, uh, in the tau going to zero limit, W itself becomes white noise. Now, it's a structural law. It's a structural extension of an object. So if I put it in an external flow field, if I have a rod-like object and I put it in a flow, the antisymmetric part of the velocity gradient, which I'm calling the vorticity tensor, will rotate it. I have a feeling my sign is wrong. Definitely my sign is inconsistent from this slides to succeeding slides. Just if, you, if you're very attentive, you can spot, you'll spot it, I'm telling you first. This bit says if I have an extensional flow, that is if I have a symmetric part of the velocity gradient and I put a rod-like thing in it, then it will tend to line up that way. That physics is in this piece. Well, it's the interplay of those two pieces, really. More than that, suppose, in addition to that, supposing you have a flow that's actually has local curvatures, locally, on some length scale, locally parabolic. This object has a local vectorial asymmetry. So if I put an object with a shape, a polar shape, this flow will orient the polar shape to point either along or anti-along the local parabolic profile. Completely missing. Excuse me. That's this bit, uh, which I won't say much about during the talk, but which is important to be, whose presence is important to be aware of for some effects that I can explore. Okay. And within this work, so th this particle is active really only because of that term. If I switch off that term, uh, it's just a dimer. And, um, and as I said, uh, noise, which you can take to be thermal if you like. So in this work, uh, the flow field is uh, God given. Uh, you don't put uh, the stresses created by the swimmers don't affect the flow field. That is plausible if the flow field stresses are, so, are much, much stronger than the active particle stresses. If your system is dilute and the stresses are not very big. So you can ask what happened, what's the dynamics of the system? So the picture basically is you've got this object here it's located at position X. It has a polarization vector W and it's in a flow field U, which depends on position. Okay. And what happens? Now, the reason I wrote the equations this way is to say, you know, I want to think of this as a particle with a position and a momentum, and I want to somehow promote its momentum or its velocity variable to a, the status of a fully fledged dynamically variable. You would say, you know, what are you talking about? There's no inertia. But the reason I can do that is I can take this right hand side, provided it doesn't have white noise in it in addition, differentiate it. I'll call it V. I'll differentiate it. And it turns out I can back out its equation of motion entirely in terms of X and V itself, X, V, and U itself. Okay. So I differentiate V. V dot will be, let's say the force is time independent. V dot will involve time derivatives of flow fields and time derivatives of W. Time derivatives of W can be re-expressed in terms of W and the flow field and noise. A yes. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. A is the anti-symmetric gradient of, of U, of U, and uh, S is the symmetric gradient of U. Uh, and uh, yeah, I guess I could worry about the divergence of U also, but yeah. So um, I, I, I'll take this pair of equations, and the funny thing is basically that I differentiate V. It involves u dot and w dot, but w dot can be rewritten in terms of w and u, but w can be rewritten in terms of v and u again. So w disappears completely from the problem, and you get 
Okay, so I'll get there in a second. Before that, I just wanted to point out, these particles are called active Ornstein Uhlenbeck particles, purely because if I switch off the flow, the polarization or extension of the particle is an Ornstein Uhlenbeck process. The fluid, it's in my hand. I can put what I like in you. And in practice, I'll, yeah, put in complexity. Meaning that there's no dynamical equation for you here because you is this given, right? Um, uh, by the way, it's not so silly to think about, you know, you might think that swimmers are typically objects with a well-defined and kind of permanent vectorial extension like an organism, but actually you can, uh, you know, these uh, shashis, uh, chemically propelled droplets are kind of active on some particles because they're droplets, like in this case, an oil droplet coated with surfactant. And you can imagine either that there's a lot of excess surfactant inside which dissolves and the place from where it dissolves off is sort of transiently gives you a vectorial orientation, but things readjust and that vector can go to zero. Or it could be that there's some chemistry which is converting the surfactant from one kind to another and the place where there's a variation. You, know, you can imagine a transient polarization, but that polarization isn't a unit vector. It really is a vector whose magnitude can go to zero. So it's not completely stupid to think of uh, active uh, OUPs. Okay. So, and yeah, these things propel actually by uh, surface flows induced by surface tension gradients and they become swimmers. They, you know, they acquire a surface flow like that of a ciliated organism and they swim. I'm saying all this, but none of this active particle physically comes into it. This is just to justify even discussing OU particles. Okay, I promised that I take this V. Uh, okay, I promised that I take V and give you its equation of motion. It's just fun to do that because when you do that and you work a little hard, then in this slightly simplified version where I've assumed F to be just a constant for external force, you get a dynamics. I, I'll take this guy differentiate V and re-express it back in terms of V uh, and U and F, I get this equation of motion for V and uh, W is gone from it, okay? So I now have a first order dynamics for X, which is purely kinematic X dot is V and a first order dynamics for V, which looks like some modified Newton's law with a drag with respect to the fluid modified slightly by the flow coupling, but otherwise this bit is really just its uh, drag coefficient. Uh, the external force ap ap appearing unadorned, I've written, rewritten it such a way that the external force is just there, the force, okay? Uh, and then there's the couplings to the fluid of a sort that are actually familiar from treatments of uh, particles moving through uh, viscous fluids and noise. And this, um, in this way of writing it, you see that tau over mu, the ratio of the, um, memory of the orientation to the uh, uh, mobility appears in exactly the place that a mass would appear. So this object, because it, something times V dot is force, okay? So this equation looks like Newton's law for the particle, okay? So all of a sudden you didn't, you didn't have inertia, but you have, you sort of uh, acquired something like inertia. And the fun thing is that this equation looks a lot like the complete uh, maxi riley equations for inertial particles in flow, okay? As I said, the, uh, the effective mass here is persistent time over mobility. If you look at, uh, so, I mean, this is a slightly different way of writing it. Just rearrange the terms, don't worry about it. The point is the complete equation for inertial particles in flow is very complicated, but uh, trust me, many of the terms over here, feature here, uh, for example, um, this and this and so forth. So uh, there's some similarity and therefore some hope that maybe some of the features that inertial particles display can also re-emerge in this uh, context, okay? Uh, there are many interesting features that are not there, such as the history term uh, known from work of people here. Um, so let's see what happens. Um, so basically, you know, imagine you place the part, our uh, active OUP in, a simple point vortex velocity field with circulation gamma or two pi gamma. Uh, note that this velocity field, even though it's got concentrated vorticity, actually has the antisymmetric gradient equal to zero everywhere except at the origin. Uh, as a natural length scale, time scale tau coming from the particles 
uh, the, the orientation and relaxation time, the extension and relaxation time, and the natural length scale given by this combination of circulation and time. Okay. Of course, I actually I'm going to cheat, and this is not really a static talk anymore. I'm going to switch off the noise. So the motility is only going to be transient. So I'm really sorry to be saying this at a meeting on, yes, statistical physics. Yeah. Will this go through because we're dead I'll do that skills. next, yeah. in the next five minutes and two seconds, one second. Yes, Mahesh wants a mic. No, no, then the, the wider world outside, the, the throngs that are online listening to this talk won't hear you. No, you switch it off. Uh, whether it has a Maxi Riley type of a feature would depend upon the strength of your motility. Mm, if no. you're turning motility off, it's just a passive part. I'm not switching off motility. No. Motility is but, but let us consider the hypothesis. Motility is essential. Where... Motility is essential and for an active Einstein Nullenbeck particle, the only thing that really makes it motile is that is the presence, is the uh, persistence of the extension vector W. Then let me explain why mm. I'm, where I'm getting confused. Mm. If I think of a passive particle in a flow, this is probably beyond uh, at some non-zero finite Reynolds number. The particle is so small, it's in the Kolmogorov regime, in the Kolmogorov scale, where it sees yeah. a Stokesian flow field. Right. But if I look at the macroscopic picture, you are showing me uh, aggregation and of particles. Oh, but, the, you know, but, but, in the, but, but at the sub Kolmogorov scales, that is where the Lyapunov exponents are positive and you should see the chaos. If I go beyond into the inertial range, then I have the Richardson type of dispersion where particles should diverge. So what am I missing here? I'm getting confused between the turning on of activity and how that changes the particle dynamics relative to the flow dynamics. So first of all, the flow dynamics is an imposed flow from the background, okay? That's one thing. Uh, the, particles, the particle has a persistence of motion which, by, which it, what, by which I mean that it isn't, okay, what's I to say? Depending on its self-propelling speed compared to the RMS velocity of the background, you can or cannot uh, go across its streamlines. And also, this is probably not the best example, the active run-in particle or the, the kind of permanent active dimer is a better one. Okay, so, but anyway, so if you write down those equations of motion in uh, circular polar coordinates and look at the dynamics of the the object that you can call the angular momentum per unit mass and the radial coordinate, then you see that a centrifugal term emerges, even though the particle has no inertia, because the, because the velocity now has an autonomous dynamics, the angular momentum has an autonomous dynamics. Okay, and therefore L all of a sudden is promoted to the level of a true dynamical variable and L squared over R cubed emerges. So you can ask what happens. There are other terms. The apolar flow coupling comes in in a couple of places. The polar flow coupling comes in. We won't look at it. So we're sort of looking at it in the funny limit, as I said, in which this particle has motility determined by which way its head is, but its coupling to flow in this analysis is uh, apolar. Uh, there's something very weird about this problem, which is that uh, the motility parameter completely scales out of the problem. And that happened as soon as we played this stunt of writing the effective equation of motion. The motility comes in only if I keep polarity as well. I don't completely understand this. I'm, I, I lose sleep over it. I did last night, um, but there it is, okay? All right, and you get uh, uh, caustic formation as a comparison between the inertial and the active OUP case. There are differences of detail, but uh, basically the idea again is this. How does, where does the centrifuge come from? Ultimately, it comes uh, from the flow coupling. The flow reorients that orientation vector and stretches it, right, in general. So, and you can, you know, you can numerically just measure uh, for some set of parameters the um, uh, number density versus radial distance and see that you get a sharp, apparently singular rise in the density. You can, I'll come to this, you can, you know, draw rays corresponding to the motion of particles, radial coordinate against time, and see that they accumulate like that. Um, you can solve the problem by looking at the inner region where you can argue that this term 
you can do sort of dominant balance between these one over R cube terms and R double dot and get an inner solution. Uh, you can actually solve it out and get the velocity as a function of R and see where it fails. And in fact, this inner solution uh, agrees with the uh, measured envelope. You can, you will find that if you start particles close to each other, but beyond the uh, threshold critical radius, you don't get caustics. And what happens is basically the time for particle trajectories to cross each other goes to infinity depending on the initial location. Okay, and there's a sort of, there's a kind of phase boundary between uh, caustics and no caustics in the flow coupling and uh, R plane. Uh, you can look at the outer solution. In the outer solution, by another scaling, you can find that you can neglect R double dot and only R dot and these functions of R matter. And what that means is that R dot, that is the velocity, is a function of R. And so you don't have caustics. Okay. Um, you can study a slightly different kind of active particle, maybe a more physical, more natural one, one in which the extension vector, rather than relaxing to zero, has a preferred length, which I have scaled here to be one. Okay, this is a soft, softened version of a strict unit vector, but that detail doesn't matter, right? And you can write down its dynamics. Here, it turns out the motility coefficient. Again, the idea is x dot uh, is, I've removed the external force, x dot is velocity times uh, this extension vector, velocity scale times the extension vector plus flow. And the extension vector has a dynamics with a potential which favors a unit length for that extension vector and flow coupling and in principle noise. So these particles, of course, keep moving. They don't, they're never passive tracers because even if they're far out, they have a non-zero extension, they'll keep traveling. And uh, you can study these, again, you can you, uh, study a slightly different, the, the, form of the caustic is slightly different, only in the sense that the, far, the stuff out here keeps swimming because it's motile. Um, you can now take a whole bunch of these and put them in a turbulent flow. So you, let's create a turbulent flow field by solving Navier-Stokes in 2D pseudospectrally. Um, not me. Um, use this velocity field. Now, you stick that velocity field into the equations of motion. Okay, the important control parameter is basically the motility divided by the RMS speed of the background. Uh, and you can measure characteristics of how and where the particles accumulate. You can look, use this parameter as a kind of descriptor of different regions in the fluid. Uh, this is actually okay, the vorticity squared minus twice the strain rate squared, which means that if it's positive, it's a vortical region, negative, it's a straining region. And, oh, I'm out. And what you see again nicely is that at low activity, you get only limited uh, aggregation. At intermediate activity, you get really sharp caustic formation. And at high activity, again, it softens. So the same phenomenon uh, is reproduced by using activity as the driving parameter. Uh, you can look at the, this, this parameter that I just mentioned. And you can see that it is uh, the particles hang about more in regions with somewhat negative uh, Okubo Weiss parameter than elsewhere, especially at this intermediate range of uh, activities. Okay. So there is sort of clumping of part, clustering of particles, caustic formation in this. Uh, sweet spot regime uh, of motility. Okay. That's what it looks like. So um, I guess I, I should just stop, and that's my summary. Many things that one can do, including write this up, I suppose. Uh, yeah, thank you. Questions for Sat? Um, so you have lots of caustics and lots of particles. So would it be useful to look at just Correlation functions of particles. yeah, I, I think actually it's useful to to look at many of those things. It's useful, and we haven't yet really looked at uh, them. Uh, yeah, hello, yeah. I have actually several questions, but I'll just okay. First of all, like if the particles are within one caustic, can they move to other caustic? How long a caustic survives once it is formed? And the third thing is like, 
the external force, suppose if you choose external force as the u is equal to zero in your equation for x dot. U, there is no, no flow field. U equals no zero means field. no flow field. Ah. Yeah, but F is chosen as the curl force. Ah. Curl force means the force whose curl is not zero. I understand, no, a non-gradient, a non-gradient. Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, non dissipative non uh, conservative force yeah yeah, I yeah um okay so i mean that sort of takes it into the class i mean meaning you can put all kinds of fields there i wanted to put in fields meaning that in the way this problem is formulated u comes in two places u comes in the position so equation u is important and u reorients the particle mm. so what you will get in the case you are talking about Amounts to externally driven active Brownian or active OU. Because particles. that also creates a vortex. That will do that, but that yeah. won't, uh, unless you deliberately also put in a coupling to the uh, polarization variable, um, a lot of this physics will be missing in that. And about caustics, how long do they survive? Like, will once they once formed, will they uh, stay for? I mean, the so point is in this, you know, if you, if you really want to study what happens with caustics here, all that happens, you have velocities that intersect and then you stop, but you can, uh, uh, I mean, the, the particles, since they are motile, the particles will anyway in general move away from those caustics. So there are uh, equations which go with the name of Jeffrey for mm -hmm. elliptical tracers. So basically, is it correct to say that your model is equivalent to a Jeffrey tracer? With a preferred roughly, that is the, the, the plus the, inertia. Yeah, the second, the the, the orient the polarization equation is like is like what Jeffrey wrote down. The difference here is the polarization isn't necessarily a unit vector. For instance, for the the the, the sort of the dimers whose equilibrium length is zero, merely having an extension itself is something that either initial conditions or noise or flow does. So it's a little different, but it's very much the same kind of idea. And there are terms in there like there's the coupling to the local parabolicity of the flow, which is not there because it's a polar flow coupling term. Yes, sir. Um, this looks like the effect of activity is not making too much of a difference. So can we construct some non-dimensional number? Which no, well, not making too much of a difference. Meaning it's it's managing to imitate inertial effects when there's no inertia. So that's not not making too much of a difference. It's making a difference, but maybe not in a shocking way. Yeah. I see. Okay. Um, I, uh, I, I just have a couple of general, probably naive questions. Uh, one is this non-inertial non particles that you said, what are some of the mechanisms by which they can affect the flow? You said they don't no, So um, each, each swim, actually, you know, if you think of a motile particle, if you think of any of us swimming, or, or even a very small particle swimming, you produce a flow field by your uh, swimming action. So that means at the very least, if you've got a little self-propelled particle, the generic self-propelled particle is a little dipole of force densities. You know, like if you look at a bacterium, it swims by pushing fluid backward and its body moving forward. Or if you look at an alga or something, it moves by pulling fluid towards itself. So these kinds of dipolar force densities are the, the, the way in which these guys affect the flow. You can also imagine particles that have higher symmetry and lack the dipole and have a quadrupolar thing. And so, so but the basic idea is, Swimming motile particles indeed exert an effect on the flow. We are pretending that those are small because the imposed flows are much bigger. And one of the things that we'd like to do is to look at the competition. Those are the things called active stresses. We'd like to look, to look at the competition. Very valid question, but it's just we neglected that here. And the other question is, uh, usually in active particles, when you talk about aggregation or clustering, how do you define it? Do you have a, because in some, I think one experimental paper that I went through that they have a, some, some cutoff distance between. Yeah, so you can do it that way. Here, I mean, we just, I just showed you pictures of the density profile itself and you know, showing, showing how singular it gets. So in general, is there any one way of doing it or? Uh... I, I would say not. Actually, you, know, you could imagine multiple ways of doing it for another reason, which is that since these particles are motile, you could actually say that two things belong to the same cluster only if they're also moving the same way because otherwise it could be a transient thing. It depends a little bit also if they're sticky or something. You could imagine once they come together, uh, that's it, like in some simple models of uh, structure formation and so forth. So it depends. I'm saying you can think of more than one way depending on the particular system you're looking at. But you need, you do need, indeed, you do need a criteria. 
if you want to talk about this is clustering. But you could do smoother things like Rahul was saying, you could measure fractal dimensions and so forth. And there you're just taking the density field, let us say, as a bunch of point, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, a sum of point measures and calculating statistical properties of it. Yeah, it's already, uh, yeah, all, exactly. Yeah. Sid, what I observed from your talk that before uh, some critical uh, point, uh, it was more like homogeneously mixed, and at some, uh, it is uh, forming more caustic, and after that, again, uh, it is going to less caustic region, right? Right. Yeah. So, uh, sir, uh, at what condition? I mean, they, there will be some specific condition where you are getting the maximum caustic region. Huh, so, that's what I said that it, it should be neither going too fast nor too slow. And in the last example I gave, that the non dimensional version of that has to do basically with the ratio of the self propelling speed to the root mean square velocity of the ambient medium, the local root mean square velocity. Okay. So, uh, that means uh, I may understand it like it. Uh, like it that uh, there is a comparison between a uh, flow uh, as well as active particles uh, velocity. So sir, if there is a comparison uh, velocity of a flow and the active particles, then there uh, we cannot neglect the effect. I mean, what I'm thinking. Uh, Which effect? Um, like the effect uh, on a fluid due to these particles, because they are- no, but That's another, that, that object, no, those are, okay. In the following sense, you may well be right. Once the particles aggregate, uh, con get concentrated enough, it is probably true that their own self-propelling stresses need to be taken into account. And that we have not done. So in that sense, yes. Okay. So yeah. sir, we are just um, looking the behavior on the particle due to this fluid, not in the other. Yes, way. at the moment, yeah. Okay. But there, there will be uh, the other way situation as yes. well. In principle, yes. But I think one would have to look at the particular experimental situation, what kinds of concentrations one is starting at, at what point in the caustic formation process it becomes important. It could well be that the route to caustic formation doesn't need it, doesn't require it so much. I mean, for instance, if you have plankton swimming in the sea, I don't know that they affect the sea very much. Okay. I mean, uh, hydrodynamically. Until they, hmm? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sir, yeah. sir one more thing. Um, as we know, uh, for the motility induced phase separation, there, there is some critical uh, uh, packing fraction. Then uh, they will form a large cluster. So is it in the same uh, for the acoustic as well? Uh, Actually, one, some... one, one problem here is the, at the moment, we, we've not really put in particle size in a proper way. Okay. Okay. Um, so in MIPS, it's very important that the particles not only move and encounter each other, but can't go through each other. Yes. Right? Yes. And therefore, the rate limiting uh, process is the turning around to get out of each other's way. And if that turning around is too slow compared to the influx, you get condensation. Yes. We haven't looked at the analog of MIPS here. And for that, I think one needs finite size particles. You need, you need excluded volume. Okay. okay. Sir, one more question, sir. Does it also depend on the shape of the particles? Or say, once, particles? Once, you put in, once you put in excluded volume, shape will become important. Right now, shape enters only virtually through this orientation vector. Okay. Right? So it's not there. You could imagine even putting in shape in the funny ways in which Deepak puts in shape by having infinitely thin particles that can't get in each other's way. Probably in three dimensions, that's not, okay. might not, yeah. 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 Okay. Sir, so uh, yeah. if, if I take. Question number five. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so, sir, if I take an elliptical particle and spherical particle, yeah. In the motion from these two particles will be different or? Yeah, it probably would be. One thing is it also depends on, you know, this, even the spherical particles reorientation dynamics matters because if it has a motility, it's got a little vector of some kind in there. Okay. okay. On the other hand, it's true that its flow coupling will be entirely that it just, it tumbles kind of, at the, it has the same, it tumbles at, the, at a rate given just by the local water state. It doesn't have interesting orbits. So it will be different, but all that, I mean, all that is going way beyond what we've done here. Okay. 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 Thank you, sir. So uh, Sriam, maybe just one last quick question. Uh, I was wondering about the memory term, which uh, was not present. What would happen? Which if, memory term was not present? Uh, the one over square root T minus tau. In the or the passive history term. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'd have, you know, I'd have to really, uh, I 
I'm not going to commit to what I need to do to this model to get a basket history term. I don't want to worry about the real inertia of the particle. It'll be interesting if I could cook up some way in which it came out without the real inertia, but I'm at the moment hitting a blank when I think about that. So I'm not going to answer the question. Okay, so maybe we, uh, yeah. I mean, maybe we should maybe thank Sri Young first and uh, for a very nice talk and sort of centrifuge out and cluster near lunch. Uh, and we come back again at 2.40, Abhishek, is that right? Okay, thank you.